Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering together today. We thank you for such an evening like this when we can gather and learn the word of God together. We bless your name, Lord, because of the interest we have and because of the desire we have to know you more. We know that every time you come, your spirit is always revealing Christ unto us. And how glad, how happy we are to know more of Christ every time we come. Because he is our savior. He is our sanctifier. He is the one that is holding our hands so we do not fall. He is the all in all for us. And the more we know about him, the better for us. Therefore, Lord, we are praying that as we come today once again, and we come to read your word, that we'll not just read like other people read without understanding. We'll read, we'll have understanding in Jesus' name. Not only to have understanding, to be able to tell other people, we'll have real experience of the Lord. That this study of the word of God, making us to know Christ more, will make us to become intimate with him more than ever before in Jesus' name. And we pray that our intimacy with him will lead us into deeper, rich experiences with the Lord more and more. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study once again today. It's always the joy of my heart to be with you at the Bible study so that we can open the scriptures together. You need to know, and I've told you many times, that the study of the Word of God is the backbone of the believer. There may be many people today that are, that are claiming to be saved, but the unfortunate thing in Christendom is that many people are ignorant of the Word of God. And because of the ignorance of the teaching of the Word of God, they are easily tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They are easily confused by the strange doctrines that are coming in our day. They do not know of the exalted Christ. And when anybody comes to tell them about an alternative, they easily fall prey to such deception because their knowledge of the word of God is minimal. That's why it's the joy of my heart to always share with you and uh, to look into the word of God with you as we go into the deep study of the word of God. Today we are studying quite a long passage. It's in Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 9 to verse 18. Well, you see, the study of the New Testament is a little bit different from the study of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you have uh, mostly narratives. That is, you have stories. And sometimes you can take 20 verses, you can take uh, 30 verses and study. Because actually that's just the flow of a story. Once you get the story, the conclusion, and the principle there, then you have understood the passage. The same thing you'll find uh, sometimes in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And even Acts of the Apostles. Because it's reporting the events that are taking place. It's reporting stories or histories of things that have been done. Sometimes you can take a whole chapter, 20 verses, 25 verses, and run through everything because it's, uh, you know, it's that kind of study. And you bring out the lessons that the Holy Spirit is teaching us there. When you come to the epistles, it's different. Because there you are having the very mystery of redemption. You are having the mystery of the kingdom. And you are given in concentrated form. And then we have to come together like this and analyze everything, put everything into pieces, explain and expound and apply, so that we'll be able to understand the depth of the knowledge of the mystery of the kingdom. That's why it takes us a very long time to cover a large ground in the epistles. You see that today we are now in study 7, and we're just in chapter 2 of the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. But um, we are getting so much from the word. And you've seen that uh, in this epistle to the Hebrews, we are being confronted face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have known him in the flesh before, but now we have seen him in glory. We have seen him walk in the streets of Jerusalem. We have seen him in Galilee. We have seen him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ was veiled, was covered. It wasn't, you know, it was just a a glimpse of it we saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. But now that you are going beyond the cross, on the other side of the cross, in fact, you see him in glory. Then you see the beauty. You see the mystery, you see the godliness, you see the mystery of godliness, the divinity of Christ. 
And that's why we are slow going from verse to verse so that we can understand the mystery of the glory or the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we come to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 9. And look as I read with you. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bring him and his sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. Verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things he behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful, high priest in all things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Verse 18, for in that he, he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Those are the verses that we're looking at today. And actually these verses presented a great mystery to the Jewish people as well as to the Gentile people. The Greek or the Romans, it presented a great mystery for them. This is a mystery. In fact, it was very difficult for them to understand. And do I say there is nobody can, that can really fully understand it today. You cannot really understand the fullness of the mystery of incarnation. How God became man. How man had to die. You know, what we know about God and what we even know about angels is that God cannot die and that angels cannot die. That's the understanding that the Jewish people had carried in their mind many, many years, in fact, many centuries, millennia. We might even say that is thousands of years. But now, uh, they were being told that actually Jesus is God. And they didn't have any misunderstanding about that. Jesus was so very clear. In fact, there was a time they took up stones to stone him. And he said, why do you want to stone me? Many good works have I done before you. For which of them do you stone me? Then they said, we are not stoning you for the good work you have done, but you, listen to this, being man, you make yourself God. So they had no uh, misunderstanding at all about it. Jesus claimed to be God. Was it only Jesus alone that claimed to be God? In fact, the prophets have prophesied about him. They also talked about him as the divine one, as the eternal one. In fact, they spoke about him very clearly as God. You remember Isaiah prophesying about the Messiah, the one to come. He said unto us, a child is born. He said unto us, a son is given. Then he said, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Then he said, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. There we are. He said that the Messiah will be God. In fact, in another prophecy, he said he will call his name Emmanuel. What's the meaning of that? God with us. That was the mystery. That God will come to earth. That he will stay with us. That he will be with us. In short, that he will become man. That's incarnation. That is saying the same thing as John had said. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Not only that, that word that was God became flesh. That is, God became man. That was a thing that the Jews could not comprehend. They could not understand. It was a mystery that God could become man. And a greater mystery was even the fact that Jesus Christ had to die. If they were still battling with the other mystery that God became man. And then this other one came that Jesus Christ, uh, God becoming man, the incarnate God, he also went to the cross and he died. Because of that, they couldn't understand. They couldn't understand. And they persecuted the early believers. 
But that mystery is not uh, incomprehensible only to the Jews. Even the people today, today cannot understand. How could men understand that God will become, will become man? And in becoming man, he even had to die. Christ had to suffer, he had to die. The cross was a serious stumbling block to the Jews, and to the Romans, and to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, and to the people that are still alive today. Christ had to become man so that he could die for our sins. And it is his death, only his death, that could accomplish the salvation of man. You remember as we talk about man, the history of man, God created man in innocence, in righteousness, and in holiness. But man lost all that through sin. He also lost his dominion, glory, and crown. And a curse came upon man. And Jesus Christ came to remove that curse so that man could be crowned. Listen to this. For the curse to be removed. And for man to eventually be crowned. Jesus had to die on the cross. The way out of the curse to the crown was the way of the cross. For the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to become man and he had to die for mankind. He had to take the place of man. And uh, therefore he had to suffer the death penalty that men should have suffered. That then brought him to be very precious unto us. Because in just that thing that I've told you now, the story of redemption, he became number one, our substitute. Number two, our savior. Number three, our sanctifier. That's what the passage is revealing to us today. And we have three points in the study. Number one, Christ, our substitute. Number two, Christ, our savior. Number three, Christ, our sanctifier. Let's take those points one by one. Let's look at um, uh, number one, Christ, our substitute. I'm coming back to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. For we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The very fact that Jesus Christ was God had been taken up in chapter 1 of Hebrews. You remember in chapter 1 of Hebrews, we learned about the greatness of Christ, the exaltation of Christ, the eternity of Christ, the very fact that He was infinite in all His attributes. In short, He was God, greater than angels, greater than all men, greater than the patriarchs and the prophets and the people of Israel and any other person that ever lived. And in fact, directly we are told that the Father Almighty God in heaven called Jesus Christ His Son. He called Him God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Just to remind you. But unto the Son is saved. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Here is that one that the, the prophet has had spoken about as the mighty God. As the everlasting Father. As Emmanuel, God with us. There is no doubt about it. He is God. Here is the one that David has spoken about. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit here on my right hand, Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. There is no doubt about it. He is God. Here is the one that Thomas spoke about, When he knelt before him and worshipped him, And he shouted and cried, The cry of adoration and worship, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are the people that have not seen, And yet they have believed. Here is Jesus. Jesus Christ he is both Lord and God. Here is the one that appeared to John, the beloved on the Isle of Patmos. And he said, I am Alpha, I am Omega. I am the beginning, I am the end. I am the first, I am the last. I am the one that was and is and will ever be. He is God. The Father said, He is God. And also Thomas, the believer, said, He is God. And the prophet in the Old Testament proclaimed him to be God. He himself declared, and we know it's a personification of the truth, he said he is God. And yet, here is the mystery, that the Word became flesh. And here in this uh, passage I've read to you, he became flesh. Look at it now from verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He took part of the same, 
God, He became man. The Word became flesh. He became the incarnate God. He now came to live in our midst. He took on human flesh. He took on human form. He humbled Himself. And then we are told He did that for a purpose, but still to continue on the incarnation. Look at verse 16. For verily He took not on Him the nature of angels. When he came into this world, he did not take the nature of angels upon him. If he did, how would he have died? Because angels don't die. It was in particular to die. In particular so that he can suffer the punishment of our sin. Because the soul that sinneth shall die, the wages of sin is death, so that he will be subjected to that punishment on our behalf. That's why he took on him not the nature of angels, he took on him the seed of Abraham. So that he will be able to die for us. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, in all things, it, be it behooved him, it befitted him to be made like unto his brethren. Made like unto his brethren. He came into this world. And he came uh, through the virgin Mary. And he was born. And he was like a baby. And then he suffered. And you know that all he went through. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he was tired, he was weary, he slept. Everything that uh, happened to men happened to him except sin. He was even tempted with all temptations that we go through and yet without sin. It says he went through all that to be a substitute that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. All that incarnation, God becoming man. The world becoming flesh. Christ putting on human form. He did all that so that he will make reconciliation for the sins of the people. We're even told that he went through the experience of temptation. You know that in Matthew chapter 4. You know that also in Mark and in Luke. Now look at verse 18. For in that he himself suffered being tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. Everything in his human experience is so that he will become our substitute. He went through the experiences he went through without sin. And he went to the cross to be our punishment. All so that he will be our substitute. And verse 9 summarizes it very well. Look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That is in his incarnation, when the word became flesh, when God, when divinity put on humanity, when he became flesh and he became a man, he was a little lower than the angels for a period of time, for the suffering of death. But now we see him crowned with glory and honor. He didn't remain in the grave, he rose from the dead, glorified. And the glorified Christ has now gone to heaven. When I see him, he is up there in heaven, crowned with glory and honor. Is now King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But then coming back to what happened when he came to this world in verse 9. That he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Taste death for every man. Taste death for every man. You see in the olden days, the kings before they drank their wine. There will be somebody that will taste that wine for him. You know why? So that if there was any poison there. It was that person, the wine taster, that will taste the wine and discover the, uh, the poison. And if he died, he died for the king. They did that to protect the king. But then he tells us, here is a marvel, here is a mystery of redemption. Instead of the slave tasting the wine, tasting the rod for the king, it was the king, the supreme one, the mighty one, that came to taste the death and the poison even for us. That is the great mystery. That is the marvel of redemption. That is the beauty of the love of God that he tasted death for you. Now you don't have to drink of the cup of the wrath of God. Now you don't have to bear the punishment, the penalty for your sin. Because the king had come. The Lord had come. Jesus Christ had become man. And he died for you on the cross of Calvary to take your place. He has now tasted death for every man. As you think about it, your heart trembles. And you have joy in your heart. And at the same time, you have uh, uh, the, the, the sorrow, the sorrow in your heart that you...
Of all people, you are nothing in yourself. And yet Christ came. He valued your life so much. He valued your soul so much. He paid your penalty. He took your place. He died for you. He became your substitute. He had tasted death for you. Now when we say he has tasted, when the Bible says he has tasted death for you, he has tasted all the areas of death for you. There is physical death. He died for you. And now the apostle says, death where is thy sting? The pain of death, the sorrow of death, the hopelessness of death. Christ has taken that away from you. Be, from you. Because now, if you, when you are going to die, if you are going to die at all, if you, that is if you die before the rapture, and you are passing through that gate to go into glory. And it is for you, death is the gateway to glory. It is the hope of the believer that when you die, and you are not dying, you are not dying a miserable death, a, a hopeless death. You are passing from that gate unto glory. The sting and the pain is taken away. It tasted that death for you. Separation from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He has tasted that for you as well. Now you don't have to say, I'm forsaken by God, I'm abandoned by God, I can never see God, I'm separated from God. You are reconciled with God. Why? Because He tasted that for you. There is also the final death, the eternal death, the second death, eternal final separation from God. You will not be separated from God anymore in eternity because He has tasted that death for you. Because He tasted death for every man. Now you can be saved. Christ has become your substitute. In fact, this is the marvelous story of redemption. And it comes up over and over in the New Testament. As uh, we see Jesus Christ on the pages of the New Testament. Turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John said, Jesus coming unto him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, which taketh away, he bears your punishment, he bears your sin. Now, John understood, that is, John the Baptist, he understood, because he was the son of Zechariah, and Zechariah was a priest, and the priest knew, and the son of the priest knew, that the lamp was to die, to take the punishment of the nation, the punishment of the sinners away. And when John saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming, he knew this is the lamp provided by the Father. To take the sins, not only of the nation of Israel away, but in the, the sins of the world away. And he said, see our substitute. See the one that will replace us. See the one that will be our punishment and penalty. Behold, the lamp of God, we take the sin of the world away. And when you think of the sins of the whole world, of every nation, of every tribe, of every individual, of everyone that had ever been born. The sins of all the world is Jesus Christ that took everything away. You will never understand. The load, the weight of the agony and the suffering that Jesus Christ bore. How can you understand? No pen of any writer can explain. No tongue of any speaker can proclaim it. When you think of all the sins of all the people, of all the generations that they ever committed, that will ever be committed, everything laid upon Christ, of the people that have been born, and the people that have not been born at the time of Jesus Christ, everything laid upon Jesus Christ. When you think of all the punishment that all the people of the world, of all the generations, should have suffered all through eternity, everything laid upon Jesus in a moment of time. It was a heavy load. No wonder he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he drank that cup. He tasted that death for every man. That's the mystery of redemption. That's the mystery of our salvation. That's the mystery of the kingdom of God. The plan of redemption. But then the joy is this. He did it for you. He did it for you. You don't have to suffer the penalty of your sin. You can be saved. You can lay everything upon him, even right now, and be totally free from the burden of your sin. He died for you. He bore it all, and he bore it just for you. So John cried out, and he said, Behold the lamp of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Before him, the prophet Isaiah had seen that. Had seen that Christ, 
the Messiah will come to suffer and he will be our substitute. I told you that the children of Israel, the Jewish people, and they didn't understand the mystery. If they had read only Isaiah, they would have understood. They would have understood how Christ, who is God, will become man and then will die. Because he proclaimed him to be God in um, Isaiah chapter 7. He called him Emmanuel, God with us. In chapter 9, he called him God, the mighty God. And now in chapter 53, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. He now called him man. And he said he will bear the punishment of our sin. Look at it from Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. That's the mystery. God, Emmanuel, in, in chapter 7. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, in chapter 9, verse 6. Now is the man of sorrows in chapter 53. This is incarnation. This is the fact that he will be a substitute. He will put on flesh. Not, not that he will come like an angel. He will come like the seed of Abraham. And then he said, acquainted with grief, and we hid the seed were our faces from him. He was despised, and, and he was esteemed, and we, we esteemed him not. In verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs. He carried our griefs, a substitute. Carried our sorrows, a substitute. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. That's a substitute. He was bruised for iniquities. It's a substitute. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. See, the emphasizing the very fact that he is a substitute. And with his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let there be no doubt in your mind. He became our substitute. He tasted death for every man. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The moment you come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, every bad thing you ever did, every evil thing you ever did, every sin you ever committed, known to men and not known to men, every evil thing that ever came out of your life, everything is laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a substitute. My friend, why will you die in sin? Why will you allow sin to push you to the point of death and then going to hell forever? He died for you. He bore your punishment for you. He is our substitute. He tasted death for every man. You don't have to take that poison. You don't have to take God's indignation. You don't have to take the wrath of God, the penalty, the punishment, the load of sin. You can now shift from the Lord Jesus Christ as your substitute. Well, I told you that John knew about it. John believed, but he knew about it. I said, I believe, he knew about it. Can I tell you the testimony of a person that did not even believe? But all the same, God used him to prophesy that Jesus Christ will bear the sin of the nation and the sin of the world and the sin of all the people. You know, it is a wonderful thing when God can even use people against their will to prophesy and to tell us with beyond any shadow of doubt that this Jesus Christ was meant to be our substitute. Look at it in John chapter 11. John chapter 11 from verse 49. Here we find the prophecy coming out of Caiaphas. He was the high priest at that time. And he said what he didn't fully comprehend, what he didn't fully understand. And in John chapter 11 verse 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Here we are told the unbelieving high priest, even God put the word in his mouth, and he said Jesus will not be dying for himself. He will not be dying like a criminal. He will be dying as a substitute. That means his death was a vicarious death. That means the death for another. To take the place of another. He said it is expedient. It is proper that one man should die for the people, the holy for the unholy. 
The just to die for the unjust. The perfect to die for the imperfect. The Lamb of God for that nation. That is that Jesus Christ will die and pay the penalty for sin. The sins of other people. Was it only for Israel? No, not alone at all. Verse 52. Not for that nation only. Not for that nation only. But also that you should gather together in one. The children of God that was scattered abroad. Telling us that his death will not just be for the Jewish people alone. It will be for many people, many nations, many tribes, everywhere. In um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 15. And that he died for all. You see, the Bible makes it very clear. He died for all. We need to emphasize this. Maybe I told you before. There are some people that will tell you that Jesus only died for the elect. Those uh, perpetrators and teachers of eternal security, they will say that uh, the elect people are the people that had been saved from all eternity before they were born. God had decided they will be saved. And then when Jesus died, it was for the elect he died. That's why they say that uh, when they are saved, when such people are saved, they can never backslide, they can never be lost again, because after all, they had even been saved before they were born. And they had been saved before they ever repented. They had been saved, their names have been written down in the book of life before they came to the Lord. Because of that, it was decided from all eternity that they will be saved, whether they liked it or not. Those are the people that preach eternal security and predestination. He died for all, not only for the elect. That's why the Bible says, Whosoever will may come and take the water of life freely. If you want to be saved, you can be saved. Don't allow anybody to confuse you. In this verse 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, And that he died for all, that they which live shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. He died for you. That's the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is for all men. In First uh, Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom for all. He is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. He says over here that he gave himself a ransom for all. To be testified in due time. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. In 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous is the propitiation for our sins. The apostles said, those of us who have believed, we shouldn't continue in sin. Little children, new converts, even in your state of immaturity, you shouldn't sin. All of us, he said, Christ has saved us. Then he said, but if any of you sin, go back to the cross. Go back to the Lord. Go back to our Redeemer. Go back to our Savior and our substitute. He died for you, remember. Until you close your eyes in death, the opportunity is still there to be calling upon him. This is the thing that uh, we have as a privilege that you will not die in hopelessness, in backsliding, or in sin. It's a propitiation for our sin. Then he said, not for ours only. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, very clearly then, he tasted death for every man. Let us come back to you. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, the latter part of verse 9. It says, and that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. He has tasted that death for you and for me. Because of that is a perfect substitute. But not only that, it's also a savior. Well, that is uh, the natural link between the substitute and the savior. The very fact that he died for you make, makes him his, uh, your substitute as well as your savior. That brings us to point number two. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, we're told that is the captain of our salvation. Look at verse 10. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, 
to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. This point two emphasizes the fact that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Now you will see in that verse 10 it refers to Christ as the captain of our salvation. That is, the author of our salvation. What does that mean? Our salvation did not originate from any human being or from an angel. No human or angelic mind had anything to contribute to our salvation. No one could have thought out such a plan of redemption except God who is great and infinite in love and power and grace and wisdom. Now listen, because of his love, he had to plan for salvation. But remember, he's also a holy God, and therefore sin must be punished. So he couldn't just say, well, I love you human beings, therefore I pardon your iniquity. He will be contradicting himself because he had said, the soul that sinneth shall die. That even though hands be joined in hand together, sin will not go unpunished. And yet he has love. And yet he's holy. And the holiness must not contradict the love. And the love must not water down the holiness. The justice and the holiness and the love must meet together and match together. That way he had to send Jesus Christ to bear the punishment of our sin. So sin has been punished. And yet it was his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not only that, his power had to come into place. Because if Jesus died for our sin, were it not for the very fact that God had power, how will Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, rise up again? So God came in with his power. He died for our sins, but then his power made him to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. But understand, his love, oh yes, his power, that is true. But it was not by marriage. Because no human being, no sinner merited salvation. Man only merited death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. Talk of marriage, we had none. Talk of favor, we had none. Talk of quality, qualification, we had none. Because our sin qualified us for death. Here the grace of God had to come in. Because it was grace that gave to human beings that had no favor, no quality, no qualification, no worth, that gave up salvation. And yet it was the wisdom of God. This was the wisdom that beat the devil. Because the devil had thought it's finished for men. He had tricked, he had trapped men. He had deceived men, men and women. And the whole world in, was in the net of the devil. But then Jesus Christ came. This is the wisdom of God. And then the devil did not know how the, all this could come about. And the devil was defeated on our behalf. That's why I told you that no man could plan this salvation. No angel could plan this salvation. Only God who is great and infinite in love, in power, in grace, and in wisdom. So then Jesus Christ became our Savior. And many passages of scripture talk about Jesus Christ being our Savior. I can only refer to a few. Let's look at a few from the Bible. Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we're reading from verse 10. Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which, the, which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Let me explain that to you for a moment. The religious people of Israel, they set aside the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were trying to build an empire of religion. They were trying to build a temple for religion. That you find many people today, they are building empires for their religion. They are building temples for religion. Religions of different names, of different souls. And yet they set aside the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no religion that can save. Take the substitute away, then you have to bear your sin penalty. Take the Savior away, then you have to bear the penalty of your own sin. 
Apart from Christ, the substitute. Apart from Christ, the Savior. Every religious person will bear the punishment of his own sin. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests and the religious people and the scribes, they set the stone, the cornerstone aside. This is the stone which was set at not by you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. That tells us Christ alone is our Savior. He is the one that planned our salvation. That's what the Apostle uh, Peter said in that passage I read to you now. But was it only the Apostle that said Christ is Savior? No, even angels proclaimed him to be Savior. In Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Reading from verse 10. For and the angels said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring, you, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. There are some misguided people that tell us that Jesus Christ only died for the Jews. In fact, sometimes uh, you'll be shocked, you'll be surprised. When you see some of the uh, things that some religious people are writing in the newspapers in the name of religion, some of them even stand for Christian preachers, Christian writers. It may be in their Sunday column or it may be in another kind of column that those writers are saying, Jesus, oh yes, he died. Oh yes, he was Savior. But he died for the Jews. He was the Savior for the Jews. And then they are saying, let Africans find their own Savior. Let the Asians find their own Savior. Let the other people find their own Savior. The Jews have got their Savior. We need a Savior. The angel said, I bring unto you good tidings, good news of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is called the Lord, Christ the Lord. So then you see Jesus Christ is Savior, the only Savior. There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. It is Jesus Christ that is the Savior of the world. The Samaritans tell us that very clearly. In John chapter 4. John chapter 4 verse 42. Uh, you remember that Jesus Christ uh, met that woman uh, at the well in uh, Samaria. The Samaritan woman. And then that uh, woman said, we know that the Messiah is coming which is called the Christ. When he's come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus revealed himself to her and said, I that speak unto you, I am he, the Messiah, the Christ. And now the, all the other Samaritans, they came. And they listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is their conclusion that they were inspired to put down for us. John chapter 4 verse 42. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. Well, there are other people that tell us, yes, we believe that Jesus is the Savior. Then when they explain what they mean, then you see they are really unbelievers. How do they explain? They say, well, we believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. And by his perfect life, we are saved. That is, look at his life. He followed the golden rule. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. As you also follow that, and you do unto others as you want them to do unto you, and you are a moralist, and you are a good man, following the example of Christ, the life of Christ, and the doctrine of Christ, and the teaching of Christ, and the advice and the counseling of Christ, then you will save yourself. The Bible says no. It is a suffering of death. It is a penalty that he bore. It is the blood that he shed that becomes the very basis and the ground and the reason for our faith in him to be our savior. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18 and verse 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition uh, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
We're not saved by corruptible things, by silver, by gold. Uh, we're not saved by any mundane thing, any material thing. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, a lamp of God who died for us and is without spot and without blemish. It is faith in that blood that saves us. Look at Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Not just faith in his doctrine, faith in his blood. Not faith in his perfect life, faith in his blood. Not faith in the example he set for us, faith in his blood. Not faith in the golden rule, faith in his blood. Oh yes, he lived a perfect life. It was a wonderful example. He lived a spotless life. He lived without sin. He gave us the golden rule, but all that cannot save. Because man is rotting at heart. Man cannot follow a righteous life without the aid, without the help of the Lord. Without the redemption or the salvation of the Lord. You cannot just follow the golden rule. The perfect example of Christ. The teaching of Christ. Without salvation. That's why that teaching alone by itself cannot save you. It's the blood of Christ that saves. Read everything from verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God to declare His say at this time His righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. You believe in him, that is how you get saved. But then the passage we have studied and we have read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 talks about the suffering of Christ. What suffering is he referring to there? Is the suffering of his death. Well, this is what you find in scripture. That it is through that suffering that he became our Savior. Well, he himself, when talking to the disciples after he rose from the dead, he said in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, Thus it is written, And thus it behold Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. You see, he suffered and then rose on the third day. That's the suffering of death. It's not just, well, uh, people, so yes, he suffered. He suffered uh, when he was a baby. They carried him to Egypt. They brought him back. He suffered persecution from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. He suffered this way and that way. That's not the suffering that saves us. It's the suffering on the death of Calvary. It is written. And it befitted Christ to suffer the suffering of death and to rise from the dead on the third day. Not only that, we're told the same thing in Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer is the suffering of death. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21, we're told over there, he has left us an example, Christ also suffered for us. But then what's the purpose of all this uh, suffering? In uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, By each, uh, for it became him, for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in verse 10, in bringing many sons to glory. The purpose of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ is to get us saved, but not to get saved and backslide. There are some people that play with salvation. They just say, I'm saved. And the following months or the following year, they are gone back into the world again. They were saved, now they are backsliding. But the purpose of our salvation is to make us endure to the end and eventually be brought unto glory. Please understand that. Because He wants us saved, He wants us to endure to the end, He wants us to be brought unto glory in bringing many sons unto glory. So then salvation does not end at the point when you gave your life to the Lord, when you raised up your hand, when you repented of your sin, when you said, I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to keep on, He wants you to keep on until He can bring you to glory. 
when you repented of your sin, you became a child of God. It says, to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to those that believed on his name. When it says sons of God, it's referring to both brothers and sisters. That's the name that is used for all of us. We become the sons of God. Other times we are called sons and daughters. Other times we are just simply called brethren, believers, sons of God, inheritors of the people, co-heritors of the Lord. That is, you are now the sons of God. He wants to bring you to glory. That's the reason you are saved. He wants to bring many sons unto glory. How does he do that? That leads us to the very next point. To bring you to glory. To bring you to heaven. To make you to reign with him. To make you to share in his eternal glory. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be sanctified. That's the third point. Christ our sanctifier. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. If you are going to partake of that final glory, you will need to be holy. You will need to be sanctified. You cannot just remain ordinary like that and say, well, I'm moving on. Eventually I will come to glory. No, not at all. Look at what the scripture says in um, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for each, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Bring you to glory. A glorious church. How does he present you to himself as part of the glorious church? By sanctification. By that cleansing. By purifying your heart. By making you holy. That's the process or that is the art by which he brings many sons unto glory. He says that he might present you to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Once again, that's the purpose of the Lord. He wants to bring us into glory. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. Second Corinthians 3 18. But we all, with open face, beholding him, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's how it brings us to glory. You are looking at him. Intently at him, seriously at him, and you want to be transformed into the same image as that of Christ. And it is as you do that, believing on him, beholding him, gazing on him, wanting to be transformed onto the same image as that of Christ, he brings you to glory. He wants you to become conformed unto his image. He does that by sanctification. In Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 29. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many uh, brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. You see, it does not start, it does not stop with justification. You are justified, then you keep on living that life until you endure to the end, and then you are glorified at last. He brings you to glory. Now, I've spoken about this sanctification. And it is very important that you realize that Jesus Christ is our sanctifier. I'm sure you know that the Bible says, Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Let's look at it. Many of us know that. There may be newcomers who don't know where that is in the Bible. New converts who may not know how important, how essential that is. Open your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. Well, you need to follow peace with the believers in the church, believers in your district, believers in the local church, and unbelievers in your home where you are living. If you want to be brought to glory at last, you want to be in heaven at last, 
you cannot be the fighting type, the one always in conflict, the one that is not at peace with anybody, not at peace with husband or wife or children or parents or co-workers or neighbors or co-tenants or people in the church and then say, well, I'm moving on to glory. There's nothing like that. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It says peace and holiness, not isolated holiness. There are people that claim to be holy and they are touchy. There are people that claim to be holy and they are so sensitive. There are people that claim to be holy and they cannot accommodate anybody. They cannot be at peace with anyone. It's the combination of peace and holiness. Without that peace and holiness, no man will be able to see the Lord. But understand, no man will see the Lord without holiness. And no man will be holy without Christ. Because it is faith in Christ that purifies us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How do you see God? By being pure in heart. How will your heart be purified? By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says it makes no difference between us and them. Purifying their hearts by faith. Our salvation comes from the Lord Jesus. Our sanctification also comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when He sanctifies you, then you are holy. Then you are pure. And you are in unity with the brethren. The apostle prayed for the Thessalonians so that they will be sanctified. And we still need to pray today if we have not been sanctified. Remember, this is so important because without it, we will not see the Lord. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, verse 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that calleth you, who also will do it. He is the one that will do it. Now let's come back to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. That tells us the evidence and the result and the consequence of sanctification. When we are sanctified, we will be united with Christ. Will be united with the will of God. You won't say, well, I'm sanctified, but I detest, I hate, I resist the will of God. If you are sanctified, your will will be swallowed up in the will of God. Because both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. You'll be united with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Ghost. And then you'll be united with the fellow believers. When you are sanctified, there will be, you will not be the cause of conflict, the cause of confusion, and the cause of division among the brethren. And if anybody is causing division or conflict, you stay away from it because you will be the reason for unity if you want to make heaven at last. You are not going to be the one that is causing confusion and conflict. In um, John chapter 17 verse 17, John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And when you are sanctified, what's the result? Verse 21. That they all may be one. Doesn't matter. We may be 100,000. We may be 200,000. We may even be 1 million. 10 million will be one. Will be one. If we are children of God, if we have Christ in us, we have the Spirit of God in us, we have the Word of God in us, we have the purpose of God being fulfilled in our lives, we want to make heaven at last, we are being prepared for glory, we are sanctified, you will be one with the people of God. You will not be rejoicing in conflict. And every time you are a son in the flesh to the believers, you may not even be a believer if you are a son in the flesh like that. It says in verse 21 that they all may be one. Not the majority of them being one, all of them. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. The world may believe that thou hast sent me. If we are divorcing our wives, are the people of the world that are divorcing their wives, are they going to believe? If we are fighting and beating ourselves, are they going to believe? If we are breaking the church apart and scattering the church, as they are doing in denominations, are they going to believe? Are they going to be saved? It is our unity that brings other people to see that we are different. 
that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Look at Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 52 and in verse 8. This talks about a unity. Thy watchmen shall lift up the, the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall bring again Zion. That's the prophecy concerning the restoration of Israel. That when Israel becomes restored, restored to salvation, restored to sanctification, restored to the entity that God wants them to be, they lost that experience because, you know, now they are scattered all abroad. And Zion is scattered all about. But a time is coming when God will gather Zion back again, will gather Israel back again. And Christ will be their Savior. He'll be their Redeemer. He'll be their Sanctifier. They'll be purified. When Zion is brought back again, they will see eye to eye. They'll be united. They'll be together. There'll be unity among them. There'll be no argument about doctrine. There'll be no argument about practice. There'll be no argument about anything. Well, the children of Israel are not gathered together yet today. But now the church are the people that are redeemed. The church are the people that are getting into the sanctification experience. And we are to see eye to eye. The pastor, the overseers, the coordinators, everyone, the members of the church, we are to see eye to eye. We are to be united as we get sanctified. In First Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is by the name of our sanctifier, by the name of our substitute, by the name of the one who suffered and died for us, by the name of the Redeemer, that ye all speak the same thing. Speak the same thing. There will be no divergent doctrines when we are sanctified. There will be no divergent practice when we really belong to the Lord. Speak the same thing. Preach the same thing. Teach the same thing. Counsel the same way. Believe the same thing. It said that ye all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together, not loosely joined together, not just humanly uh, speaking joined together, perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, if you come to Hebrews chapter 2, as we conclude, Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 11, but both he that sanctified and dead who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare the name unto my brethren in the midst of the church of the congregation, will I sing praise unto thee. Again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children whom the Lord, whom God has given him me. Here is Christ rejoicing over the church when he sees us that we have come to him, we have surrendered unto him, we are saved. And we are sanctified and we are fully yielded unto him. Then he's able to present us to the Father. And he says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me, they are saved, they are sanctified, and they are being prepared for glory. If you have not been saved, you have the opportunity here to be saved today. You can call upon the name of the Lord, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have been saved and you have not been sanctified, you can call on the name of the Lord today. All things are possible with the Lord. He can take that Adamic nature away. He can uproot that nature and that root of sin. And He can cleanse you and wash you whiter than snow. He can so purify you that you will be whiter than snow. And it says, faithfully see that has called you who also will do it. Stand up now or kneel down if you want to and pray. And make sure you have a definite experience with the Lord before you go. And after you've got that experience, keep on with the Lord, giving the chance to prepare you for glory.